Hi guys, welcome to Love Ballarat. My name's Adam. My name's Riley. We're a couple of the reptile keepers from Ballarat Wildlife Park. So today we'll be doing a bit of a discussion on, well, talking about the history of the park. And we've also brought in a special little guest to show you guys, which you can see down here on the table, uh, Growling Grass Frog. So I might uh, head straight over to Riley, and Riley can tell you a little bit about the history of the park, starting back at 1985. Yep, 1985. So, yeah, originally the park was opened uh, by Greg Parker and his family. Um, Greg Parker is still the owner today, so the park's been running now for around 30 years, um, just over that now, which is pretty impressive, and still privately owned by the same family. So they've been doing a lot of growth and a lot of um, and a lot of hard yakka to get it up to where it is now. But um, yeah, a bit more on the history of the park in general is that, uh, yeah, it was first opened in 1985 by Greg and his family. Um, at the time it was called the Ballarat uh, Wildlife and Reptile Park. Um, later on they did change the name to Ballarat Wildlife Park and scrap the reptiles. <laughs> Even though we're reptile keepers, we'd probably a lot prefer that in the name, but um, we'll stick with that. <laughs> I think that was mainly because everybody likes everything nice, fuzzy and cute. Yep. <laughs> so, a bit of a marketing ploy there, I think. That's alright. Koalas get more love than a snake sometimes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, at the time it was just a big paddock with uh, rose bushes everywhere, old car parts. The paddock was um, 27 acres. And uh, yeah, they had to do a lot of work. So beginning, uh, they started building the dam area. Uh, that was number one. Uh, number two was the reptile house. So that was first to be built. Um, so the owners had a passion for reptiles predominantly and then quickly spread to um, all species far and wide. So, but yeah, the first uh, building there was the, uh, the reptile house and the dam area. Um, after that, the property went on to build the entrance building and at the time, there was only four people working at the park. So it was Greg, his parents, and a mate in the sky. So his parents ran the uh, reception area, and uh, Greg did all of the zookeeping work. So if you can imagine one person doing all the zookeeping work, it's <laughs> a fair amount. I mean, we do it together every day, and I'd hate to see how it's like on your own. So to be fair, we didn't have the same number of animals back then. <laughs> That's true, yeah. <laughs> um, so what did we have back at the start? Back at the start we had uh, obviously the reptile house with a few native species at the time. Um, and then we also had uh, the two Tasmanian devils, um, so that was Bonnie and Clyde. And they actually became the first Tasmanian devils to breed on the mainland. So that was a um, really big win for the park in early stages. And they're still continuing their breeding work with Tasmanian devils today. We only had joeys. Um, only uh, six months ago, so that was pretty impressive. So we're still breeding those. Um, so yeah, they're really important work with that. And that's um, a really significant thing at the moment because there's a thing known as, known as uh, devil facial tumour disease. Yep. I hope I got that right. Yep. It has decimated the wild populations of devils over in Tasmania. Uh, so it's really good to be a part of the national breeding program for those guys. Yeah, um, at the time they had six kangaroos. Um, <laughs> And they had a species called KI kangaroos or kangaroo island kangaroos. They chose those species early on because they're um, quite uh, placid in nature and they get used to people really, really well. They're conditioned down very easily. Um, but they were really hard to come by at the start, so they had to get one from here, one from over there, breed up a couple. Um, now we have over 100 free roaming KIs around the entire park. So as soon as you enter the park, they're greeting you at the entry and at the doorway when you're walking out as well. So and, the, and in the reptile house? Yeah, there's, <laughs> in the reptile house. There's no part where they aren't allowed. So we're reptile keepers and we're constantly cleaning up kangaroo poo. <laughs> um, and they also had wedge tailed eagles. Um, so yeah, the park's always had a fascination with birds of prey and being um, Ballarat locals as well, that's another key species to have. Um, so there are a few key species um, and obviously you can't have a park without wombats. So they had uh, <laughs> Ben. Everybody loves wombats. Yeah, everybody loves <laughs> wombats. <laughs> can't get enough of wombats. And then obviously koalas as well. So koalas. Speaking of wombats, we've just been lucky enough to, to have a couple yeah. of new baby wombats in the pouch. So uh, a first for us, we've actually got a baby southern hairy nose wombat in the pouch, so, which is, and I actually saw it for the first time the other day, it's about that big and chocolate brown and extremely cute. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a big win for conservation as well because it's very rare to actually breed the southern hairy nose um, 
and the park's always had a long history with breeding wombats. Um, you probably all know of Patrick the Wombat. He was the world's oldest living wombat. He died in 2017 at 31 years and seven months old. And um, our oldest wombat, um, unfortunately only a few months ago, passed away. Um, Harry, he was 28, mm. and he was breeding his entire life. So we're getting them up to a ripe old age, and they're continuing to breed for us. So um, Coco and Banjo had another joey only recently as well. Um, so yeah, both the common hairy nose and the southern hairy nose are still breeding for us. So And they're notoriously difficult to breed in captivity wombats, so we must be doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. They don't often like each other. Quite solitary animals, and you put them in a space together, and behold, they don't really like each other. Mm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, love story blossoms quick in captivity sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, forming onto that, um, the park started working closely with um, Sovereign Hill and they began to gain traction in the international market as well. So bringing the international people up to um, Ballarat was helping not only the economy here, but also um, uh, every attraction in the, in the region. So um, the park became sort of an integral role to the community as well. So um, not just for the animals that we conservate for, but also the people working with them. So it was a best win of both worlds, really. Um, so, being able to bring that international market in enabled the park to start increasing and expanding. So in 2012, uh, the Crocodile Billabong exhibit um, began to be built. So you all probably know that as Crunch's area. Um, at the time, it was actually earmarked for another crocodile that Greg hand reared himself. So that um, crocodile was named Gator. He was 42 years old when he passed away. And he actually passed away during the process of the build. So. Um, it wasn't the perfect timing, um, especially since the, he was getting a massive enclosure to go into. So not only were they building this massive half a million dollar exhibit, but they had to find another crocodile to put in it, so to add on to the task. So um, Greg and his son Stuart began the search. So they went up to Northern Territory, uh, where they found Crunch. <laughs> um, at the time, he was known as Houdini, because. Uh, Mainly, he was escaping every trap and every enclosure they put him in. So they actually um, caught him at a, a uh, boat dock. He was a problem crocodile, uh, mainly because he wasn't afraid of people because people were feeding him fish off the boats at the end of the day fishing. And then when he got to around four metres in length, people went, oh, probably not a good idea to have a four metre croc swim around our tourists. So they asked to, to capture them and he, they went out with a uh, crocodile trap. The way it works is a trap door at one end, Crocodile walks in, trapdoor falls, caught a crocodile. Um, crocodile is very intelligent, and Crunch is still very intelligent that day. We see it every day when we go in with him and feed. And uh, he saw a smaller crocodile get trapped, and he went, that's not happening for me. So he used his weight and his size to advantage. He went into the cage, grabbed the meat, popped the pen off the other side and kept going. He did that twice. So on the third time, they finally got a bigger trap, captured him, brought him to a crocodile farm, and uh, he went into that farm at perfect size and age for breeding, so they put him into an enclosure with four girls. <laughs> You'd think he'd be very happy with that. Um, unfortunately, though, the girls weren't happy at all. They beat him up, they stole his food, they weren't very nice to him at all. So he went, stuff this, I'm getting out of here. So he broke out of that enclosure into another enclosure next door. I thought, this isn't to my liking either. Apparently he also went for a walk down the main street of Cooktown. That's right, so he, <laughs> the second time he escaped, he didn't just escape the entire enclosure, he escaped the entire zoo all together. So, yeah, found not walking up down Main Street, Cooktown at 9am, you can imagine getting your Macca's morning coffee at 9am, seeing a five metre crocodile stroll up. Clearly really haven't been to Cooktown, right? Like <laughs> no Macca's. No Macca's in Cooktown? <laughs> uh, but yeah, at the time they went, look, you can't keep this crocodile so you have to get rid of him and, and that was perfect timing for us. So we stuck our hand up and uh, as you can imagine, the people at Ballarat weren't too happy to hear a Houdini crocodile was coming to town. So they renamed him to Crunch, which behold, he can't escape anymore because he's now called Crunch. <laughs> and uh, they craned him through the roof and let him go and uh, gave his girlfriend, uh, gave him a girlfriend called Bella. And they've been living happily at the park ever since. So that was the first big project to, to be undertaken by the, um, the park. Um, what quickly followed um, was a snowball of development. So that was then the ocean area, so the penguin um, exhibit, or the little penguins. Again, another key featuring species because they are local. You'll find them in Frankston, in the city at the uh, Melbourne Docklands, and all the way up to what most of you would know as the Phillip Island Penguin Parade. So very key species to have. 
Um, quickly after that, they went straight away from the ocean and went into the inner desert with the meerkat exhibit. So uh, meerkats is again another cute fluffy animal that you can't have without and they're always doing something different. So we've got six girls with Jamila is the key queen of the mob. So you'll see them as soon as you walk into the park as well. Um, and I might just cut you off for a sec, Riley. We just had a question from one of the viewers asking if Crunch or any other animal has escaped from the park. <laughs> Thankfully, we can say no to Crunch, definitely. Uh, we may have had a few animals over the years escape their enclosures. Normally, we're pretty good at getting them, finding that pretty quickly and capturing them before they leave the grounds of the park. Um, there's another bit of an interesting story, a side note to, the, uh, to Crunch, our big crocodile that Riley was just talking about, and that is that Crunch and Bella were both... Uh, given to us as non-breeding crocodiles. So none of them had bred at the crocodile farm where they were housed. Um, it's been completely op opposite for us. So for the la last two years in a row now, we've actually managed to breed them. And we're lucky enough at the park right now to have 22 little baby saltwater crocodiles, which are about that big and super duper cute. <laughs> That's but right. I'll let Riley keep finishing the history of the park. <laughs> it's crazy to think that little crocodile is going to go into a you know, five metre crocodile. At 800 kilos in length and around three and a half thousand pounds of jaw pressure. So yeah, very exciting. <laughs> um, yeah, so after that development, uh, they sort of uh, took a back seat, let the park develop a little bit more in terms of growth and people coming through. And then, um, yeah, they then ventured on their next adventure. So the park had been predominantly um, native um, with the exception of the reptile house. The reptile house has always had exotic reptiles in the collection, ranging from corn snakes um, to rattlesnakes, but uh, predominantly the park was native and they wanted to tell another conservation story um, that wasn't just affecting our Ballarat region, our Victorian region or national region, but the entire world. So that then went down to the global conservation precinct and the first step of that is of the Sumatran tigers. So. We've uh, just finished building, um, some of you may have already seen it this year, our Sumatran tiger exhibit um, down the conservation precinct. We've got Maneki and Satu, and the best uh, or the most interesting fact about this is that they are critically endangered animals. There are only around 400 left in the wild and the world. So if you're, some of you have been watching Tiger King at home, you've probably seen lots about lions and tigers. And uh, thankfully, we keep ours at the, the, the premiere of... Um, of husbandry and uh, wildlife keeping. So they are very, very happy in their exhibit and not wanting to do any harm or damage to anything else. <laughs> and hopefully we'll get to breed them in the future. That's right. So they have been breeding, uh, bred in the past um, up at Australia Zoo. Um, since they've come down to us, we've had to he work heavily on permits because at the moment, no facilities ever bred tigers in Victoria. So we'd very much like to be the first. Um, and. Um, do a heavy contribution to the to the um, captive breeding of the conservation of that species as well. Um, now I did say global conservation precinct. You can't just have a global <laughs> precinct with one species. So uh, the future plans are quite exciting as well. Some of the animals on the cards down in that area are Komodo dragons, which we work closely with all the time. Um, some other species are red pandas, tamarongs. Um, there are just a few ideas at the moment. Maybe some leopards as well. So. Yeah, quite a few interesting species um, for the global precinct. So the park can now tell a global conservation story, not just on natives, but on the rest of the world as well. So um, at the time uh, when Craig first opened it up, obviously it was only four people. Um, Pre-corona, um, only a few months ago, our staff base was at 36, um, with massive markets in international as well as uh, rural and national as well. So the park's increased in popularity and hopefully yeah, after we open on Monday, it'll continue. <laughs> just going from strength to strength, hopefully. That's right. Well, now that Riley's covered, pretty thoroughly covered the history of the park, we might move on a little bit and talk about our special little guest here, which I don't know if you guys can see it now. It looks like he might have hidden himself. Might um, get Riley to, well, I might poke him out and make it a bit easier for everybody to see. But this guy here is the growling grass frog. So when I was initially asked to do this talk, I was asked if we could do a presentation on a frog known as the Creswick Barking Frog. 
Now that had uh, Riley and myself and a few of us at, at the park all racking our brains as to what could this Creswick Barking Frog be? We'd never actually heard of the term Creswick Barking Frog. <laughs> so we had a bit of an inkling that it may be what's known as the Growling Grass Frog, which is a species that we're able to work closely with at the park and have actually bred, which is really, really good. Now if I move him out there, hopefully you guys can see that. So the grayling grass frog, once the camera zooms in, you can see there, they're a really big frog. So they're one of the biggest frogs in Victoria. They may be close to the biggest frog in Victoria. Females, which this one here, you can see, can get up to about 100 millimetres in length. Now they used to be really, really widespread. In fact, they used to occur across almost the entire uh, state of Victoria. <coughs> Excuse me. Now they're actually restricted to a few fragmented populations mainly right along the Murray. Uh, there's a good population in the western suburbs of, Victoria, uh, of Melbourne, including the Western Treatment Plant. Uh, there's a bit of an isolated population out at Trawalla, close to Ballarat, and that's where our captive uh, animals originated from. These were actually wild caught for a university project, and then we were lucky enough to obtain them once that had finished. Yeah, as I said, they're highly endangered now. So they used to occur across vast areas of Ballarat, um, now they've almost gone and that's for a number of reasons so historically uh, gold was discovered in Ballarat in 1851 and that had a dramatic um, transformation of the landscape it's really really impossible virtually impossible to, in the Ballarat area to find a piece of dirt that has not been turned over <laughs> so um, yeah, so habit with uh, the gold rush came a lot of habitat destruction, cutting down trees, draining swamps for land and whatnot, and that really affected these guys. So then uh, in about the uh, 90s, we had a disease pop up called chytrid fungus. Now chytrid fungus has had a devastating effect on frogs, not just in Australia, but actually right across the entire world. So chytrid fungus um, is a horrible pathogen, it actually causes ulcerations on the skin of these guys and all frogs in general. And that uh, makes it really difficult for the frog to then control its water intake. Uh, that eventually leads to cardiac arrest and therefore a dead frog, <laughs> which isn't very nice. So yeah, these guys, their, their population's decreased by about 90% and is still decreasing to this day. So we're really fortunate to uh, work closely with these guys. So this year, we've, uh, sorry, last year, we'd only had them for about two months and we were lucky enough to first breed them. So they can have huge numbers of eggs, these guys. So certain females, these females have been recorded as having up to 3,800 eggs at a time. Now that is a huge number of eggs. And, but a normal sort of number of eggs, you're looking at two or 300 which still is a lot of work when we get two or three hundred tadpoles to raise those guys all into little froglets. <laughs> and I've just had another question come through through one of the viewers as to why we are wearing gloves when we handle the frogs. Um, that is mostly to prevent things like chytrid fungus, a pathogen I've just been talking about. We don't want to introduce anything nasty to that frog, which could then harm it or possibly even kill it. So we take the utmost care with all of our frogs and we just wear disposable gloves every time we've got to play with them or clean their enclosure or do anything with them. Also, if we're working with numerous other reptiles through the day, which we often do, mm. and we go into the frog room to service these guys, um, we could have any number of things on our hands. Um, chemicals from cleaning bowls, um, from cleaning enclosures, to um, a piece of <laughs> feces we had to clean up. Um, so any of that on our hands can be easily transferred to the frog skin and the frog skin is so delicate on its own um, for all those reasons that Adam mentioned. So yeah, it's not just um, chytrid fungus we have to prevent, but also what we're touching as well. Yeah, so these guys here, you may still be lucky enough uh, in the ballad area to hear them. They're a spring and summer breeder and they have a really, really distinctive call. <laughs> so the uh, Male frog will sit and find a really good spot in his little pond, normally in a big stand of kabungi or other sort of water weed, and he'll call to attract a female. So I can, I can do my best attempt at a <laughs> frog call. So it sort of goes something like, 
This is what I get. But we actually have a video, so we might play a video um, of a real frog doing it, and he probably does it a little bit better than me. <laughs> and uh, but yeah, he will he will call and try to. I'll just talk a little bit while I get this video ready. But he'll call and try to attract himself a nice big female like this girl here. He does a much better job at it than I, than I do. Um, but if you do hear that sound uh, in your local area, or in this area particularly, it's really good to re take recordings. Uh, even with your mobile phone, you can send that recording into places like Melbourne Museum, or there is a thing called the uh, Frog Watch, which is a program run by Melbourne Water, and they're always really interested to find out where these guys are so just they can do that just by recording so if you think you've got a growling grass frog calling from your dam always feel free to record it and pass it on to uh, the museum or as I said the frog watch program okay so we've just had another question come through and that's asking about the vision of these guys so frogs actually have um, really really a lot of frogs have a um, the word called epilip <laughs> <laughs> Pupil like a cat, I'm going to say, since I just stumbled over that. So basically it will open really wide in low light levels. So as most frogs are nocturnal, these guys are partially diurnal as well, which means they sit out in the sun and they actually like to sunbathe. But frog vision is actually quite good. So they're really, really good at um, picking out movement of small bugs and things which they eat. Um, and they probably also have colour vision as well. If you notice, a lot of frogs are really, really brightly coloured and that's probably to attract mates and whatnot. Um, yeah, so we're working on these guys, breeding these guys at the moment, mainly for to supply other captive institutions. We hope that at some time in the future that we can breed enough of these guys with permission from the relevant department to release some into the Ballarat area. These ones here are about as local to Ballarat as you're gonna get. Mm -hmm. So we do aim to do that in the future. It's just there's a lot of red tape to go through before we can sort of look at releasing these guys into the wild. Um, I might just quickly pull this guy out. It just gives you a bit better idea of size because it is a really big frog. I should have had a second pair of gloves on already. Would have made that a lot easier. Don't let our frog go, Riley. So you can see that this guy here, it's actually a really big, big frog. So it's quite big on my hand. And you can see why he's called the growling grass frog, why he's called, it uh, makes that real growly sound. And he's a nice bright green color. So they often change color, these guys. They're not always this bright green. They can go quite dark when they want to. And their color depends on the background that they're sitting on and quite often their mood as well. They're a beautiful little frog. Beautiful big frog, I should say. Thought that happy is bright green, sad is jet black. <laughs> but uh, it's still undisputed, uh, pretty disputed at the moment. <laughs> so if you go into south uh, east uh, Victoria, Gippsland, you get another frog that's very similar to this called the uh, green and golden bell frog. The best way to distinguish between the two, in some areas they do overlap, is that this guy here, has a row of lumps down his back, whereas the green and golden bell frog is completely smooth. 
He's not very happy with me at the moment. He's <laughs> doing a little distress call, little croaks and grunts at me, saying, leave me alone. He's puffing himself up like a big balloon. Herself, I should say, because this is one of our big females. I'll pop her back. We also have here one of the small ones, one of the ones that we've bred at the park. This one's a really different colour at the moment. This one's probably unhappy with being brought in out of its little enclosure. But since this one here, it's a tiny little young one. This one's only about six months old. As you see, it's got a green stripe down the back, but the rest of it's pretty brown. That could be one of two reasons, either because it's sitting on brown substrate, or it's just a little bit unhappy with the disturbance of us bringing it in today. This guy's around five months old too, so um, you can control the growth of frogs and tadpoles. So um, tadpoles, if you've got them in warm water around 22 to 24, they're going to um, increase in growth uh, quite faster. Uh, but if you've got them in cooler water, then their growth will slow. Um, it's a bit the same with um, uh, froglets as well. So as they're growing up, you feed them small amounts of food, they're going to grow a lot slower. And a lot of um, private institutions and captive institutions around the world tend to grow their animals quite fast to get them to breeding age even faster. Um, but um, some of our experience is that slower growth can often mean better productivity from breeding um, and a lot, often longer lifespans as well. So you don't have to make your frog fat straight away because it's probably going to die a lot faster. So just quickly, I just uh, wanted to mention that so the average lifespan of one of these guys in the wild is actually really short. Uh, it's only about one or two years. Uh, there's a huge difference between that and captivity. So in captivity, we regularly get these guys living to 10 years plus. So that could be due to the increase, most likely probably increased predation in the wild. And there's a lot of dangers in the wild. Um, we might just finish up with Riley doing a little bit of uh, We've got some really interesting sponsorship programs going on at the moment at the park. Um, I might let Riley talk to you a little bit about that, how you can get involved in helping us at the park during these tough times that everyone's going through. Yep. So often people love to support species and conservation any way they can. Um, other parks do this as well, we're not just the only ones, but a lot of them sort of pinpoint individual animals. So you can sponsor Jimmy the frog and learn everything about Jimmy, but sometimes not much is going on in Jimmy's life. You might not hear anything for about a year. Um, and often if you're that invested in a species, then our thought is that you want to know everything about the species in general and how they're coping in the wild, in captivity, and uh, the colony as a whole. So at the moment, and we'll continue on well in the future, is a sponsorship pro program. So that goes for any species at the park. So at the moment, we've got around 400 species, so you can choose from each one of those. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a kangaroo, a frog, a crocodile, you can sponsor uh, that species. So Any help is welcome. That's right. And it all goes directly to uh, the husbandry of the animal, uh, vet costs, and obviously the conservation of the species as well. So we want to do our utmost best to continue conserva conservation for these, or any species of animal we have at the park, um, and any species we may not have as well. So any help that you can give us would be greatly appreciated, and you'll get um, updates, um, on how those species are doing um, and uh, if there's anything more than um, that we can do or that yourselves at home can do as well. Um, so straight away for yourselves at home about frogs, you can build your own little dam and have um, frogs, native frogs come to you. And just that alone can be a great um, support for the local area of frogs um, in your town. And if you do sponsor an animal, or even you just want to know any, the answer to any question, we're always happy to receive emails asking questions or asking questions about a specific animal that you sponsored. Yep. As well. Thanks Thank for, you watching, for watching, guys. Hopefully see you at the park soon. <laughs>